Well, today we're concluding our message series, Church Without Walls, from the book of Acts. Now, in our current situation, we've been studying how the early church in Acts thrived, even though they were not meeting in church buildings. Now, we are grateful that we are able to meet again together as a church family, and God is blessing as uh, this is our second Sunday back in our building over the last, since the last couple of months. But today we're going to be looking in the final message in this series, Church Without Walls, which I've entitled Spirit Baptism. Today in the church calendar is Pentecost Sunday. It's the Sunday in which we remember and we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Now the day of Pentecost was the second great festival of the Jewish year. It was a celebration of the harvest. The first fruits of the harvest were presented as offerings to God. Now, the Holy Spirit coming on the day of Pentecost represented God's spiritual harvest of souls that was beginning through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so Pentecost marked the end of the occasional presence of the Spirit in certain individuals in the New Testament era, and it marked the beginning of the New Testament era in which the Spirit had a continual presence and empowerment for all of God's people. Now today, before we get into our text from Acts, we're going to be looking at some teachings of Jesus that will help us to understand what happened on the day of Pentecost, the changes that occurred in the moving of the Holy Spirit. Jesus taught in John 14, 17, he says, The Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. And so in this verse, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. They had put their faith in him. Uh, This verse he spoke before the day of Pentecost. And he told them that they knew the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit was with them. But in the future, Jesus said, the Holy Spirit would be in them. And so this transition of the Spirit going from being with people to being in them corresponds to being born again. Jesus said in John 20, verse 22, He said, when he had said this, he breathed on them, which is the disciples, and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. And so this verse occurs in the very last chapter of the book of John. Jesus breathes eternal life into his disciples as he sends the Holy Spirit inside of them. And this fulfills his prophecy about the Spirit that we read previously. No longer would the Holy Spirit be with them, They would receive the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit would be inside of them. And yet, having the Holy Spirit inside of them was not all that the disciples needed. We read in the final chapter of the Gospel of Luke, Luke 24, 49. And Jesus said, And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. And so the disciples already had the Spirit within them, but they needed something more. And the something more that they needed, Jesus here called the promise of the Father. And this promise of the Father would clothe them with the power of God so that they could carry out God's purpose. And as we'll see today, that power came through the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. Now, before we get started with our scripture this morning, I'd like us to watch a short video summary of the day of Pentecost called Acts 2 Pentecost. 
with what Jesus taught about spirit baptism in Acts chapter 1. We'll begin reading in verse 4. It says, And while staying with them, he, that is Jesus, ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And so the book of Acts begins after Jesus had risen from the dead. He spent some time teaching his disciples, 40 days to be exact, before he ascended back into heaven. The same disciples who had received the Spirit previously, as Jesus breathed on them and instructed them to receive the Spirit, were now ordered to wait for the promise of the Father. Now, we read in the Gospels in a number of places where Jesus prophesied that the Father's promise was the coming Holy Spirit. And in these verses, Jesus tells us that the promise of the Father is the baptism in the Holy Spirit, which he also spoke of previously. And so the mission of the disciples to reach their world for Jesus could not begin without them being baptized in the Spirit. Well, how did the disciples respond? In verse 6, it says, So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It's not for you to know times or seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority. And so it seems as though the disciples did not understand the importance of what Jesus was saying to them about the Holy Spirit. Nor did they ask any questions about his instructions. They asked a completely unrelated question. They wanted to know if the kingdom would be restored to Israel. That was a political question. The disciples were looking for Jesus, the Messiah, to overthrow the Romans and put Israel back in charge of their government. And Jesus simply told them, that's not something you guys need to be concerned about. This is not the time for that kind of talk. You don't need to be concerned about the timing of political events. Jesus had already taught them that God's kingdom was not a polit- coming as a political power. It was a spiritual kingdom. And so the disciples needed to be looking forward to, they needed to be praying for the beginning of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. That's what their focus needed to be. And so Jesus made that clear in Acts 1 verse 8. Remember, he said, it's not for you to know these questions about the government of Israel. He said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. And so what the disciples really needed was the power of the Holy Spirit. And they would receive that power when the Holy Spirit came upon them, which is another way of saying when they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. And so Acts 1.8 is really the key verse for the whole book of Acts, which we're looking at chapters 1 and 2, the coming of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost. And once the disciples had the power of the Holy Spirit, that power had come upon them, Then they would be able to fulfill Jesus' command to tell the world about him, to be witnesses for Jesus, to be witnesses in ever-enlarging circles, beginning in Jerusalem and spreading out to Judea and Samaria and ultimately to the end of the earth. And so spirit baptism is not a minor teaching in the Bible. It was a major part of Jesus' teaching. It's a major part of his equipping his disciples to carry on God's work after he ascended back into heaven. And so the spirit, the spirit baptism was to give spiritual power to Jesus' disciples so they could be his witnesses. And we're going to see as we go on this morning that it was not just the apostles who were to receive spirit baptism, but even on the day of Pentecost, many others, first hundreds, then thousands were baptized in the Holy Spirit. And this spiritual power to be witnesses involves enhancing a believer's relationship with God through the Holy Spirit. Because the power of God comes through the Spirit of God. And being baptized in the Holy Spirit gives a believer a new way to communicate with God. 
and to hear God speak back to him, back to them. And so in this way, spirit baptism could be likened to a doorway or a, a channel to the Holy Spirit himself. And through this channel, you are able to communicate with the Spirit on another level. You are able to tap into the Spirit's power whenever it is needed. Now, the power of the Spirit is seen through spiritual gifts. And that's another topic that we're not going to have time to cover in depth this morning. But it's spoken of a number of places in Scripture. Needless to say, Jesus' instructions to his disciples to wait for the baptism in the Holy Spirit so that they would have power to carry out his purpose for their lives to be witnesses was not just a command for the apostles. It was not just a command for the disciples gathered in the upper room. It was not just a command for the crowd of thousands on the day of Pentecost. As we'll see, it was a command for believers of every age, of every time in history, including our own in the year 2020. So let's see what happened when, when spirit baptism began. Moving on to Acts chapter 2, verse 1. It says, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Now, Acts 1.8, where Jesus told the disciples to wait for spirit baptism, was Jesus' last words before he ascended back into heaven. And so the disciples, the apostles and the other disciples obeyed his word. There were about 120, Scripture tells us, they gathered together to wait and pray for the Holy Spirit to come. They didn't know exactly when the Holy Spirit would come. They knew it would be within a short period of time, within a matter of days. And finally, as they were praying on the day of Pentecost, the Spirit came. The first physical sign was a, a loud, rushing, mighty wind. And everyone knew that something supernatural was happening. And then, in verse 3, it tells us, And divided tongues, as of fire, appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And so after this rushing wind, then tongues of fire representing the fire of the Holy Spirit came to rest on each one of their heads. And next, they were filled with the Holy Spirit, or in Jesus' terminology, the synonymous term terminology is they were baptized in the Holy Spirit. And the initial outward evidence that they had been spirit baptized was when they began to speak in tongues as the Holy Spirit empowered them to do that. Now, what is this speaking in tongues? Well, tongues refers to languages. So speaking in other tongues refers to the believers or the disciples speaking in languages they had never learned. Now that's not possible, humanly speaking. You cannot speak in another language that you've never learned. But this was a supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. Our story continues in verse 6. And it says, At this sound the multitude came together. And they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And so people were hearing the disciples speaking in these other tongues. But these disciples were all speaking in different languages. Now, on the day of Pentecost, there were many people gathered in Jerusalem to worship. People from many countries, from many lands had come, and they all spoke different languages. And each one was hearing the disciples speaking in their own language. It amazed people because they knew that these Disciples from Galilee and Judea did not know their languages. What were they saying? Well, verse 11, it says, We hear them, the disciples, telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others, mocking, said, They are filled with new wine. And so the disciples were praising God. They were telling of God's mighty works. They were telling of God's miracles. The crowd didn't understand what was going on. They were perplexed. They were amazed. This was something unusual. Some thought they were simply speaking meaningless chatter. They, they were drunk. They'd been drinking too much. But the disciples 
we're experiencing the pouring out of the Spirit of God for the very first time in a new way. The promise of the Father had begun. Now, in the Scripture so far, we see three groups of people. The first group is the 120 disciples who were waiting for the promise of the Father, who were praying, and now we're baptized in the Holy Spirit and we're praising God in other tongues. The second group was the people who were observing this moving of the Holy Spirit. These people were amazed. They were perplexed by this activity. They wanted to know more. And the third group was those who were mocking these Spirit-filled believers. They didn't think there was anything supernatural about it at all. They thought they were drunk. And so, in a certain way, we have these same three groups today with respect to spirit baptism. And God desires for us to be in the group of the spirit-baptized believers. But oftentimes, talk of spirit baptism or speaking in tongues polarizes people into three groups. The three groups we had back then, and it happens today as well. The teaching on spirit baptism is not just here in the first two chapters of the book of Acts. As we said, Jesus talked on it and multiple, taught on it on multiple occasions. Uh, there's numerous other passages in the writings of Paul throughout the book of Acts as well. It's a major topic in the New Testament. And there's much more teaching on spirit baptism and the gifts of the spirit throughout the New Testament that we don't have time to look at today. Suffice it to say that, that speaking in tongues is the outward sign that one has been spirit baptized. The ongoing use of praying in tongues is the key, as Paul writes later on in 1 Corinthians, to the power of the spirit in a believer's life. Without spirit baptism, a believer will never reach their full potential or the full power that God has for them. If you'd like to know more about spirit baptism, I'd encourage you to pick up a free book on our guest table, which is entitled Power for Life by Jeff Leak. It's a very comprehensive, easy read about spirit baptism from Scripture, and it's helped uh, a number of people understand it better and to receive it for their own lives. Now, spirit baptism is not just for some. It's not just for those people that lived 2,000 years ago. Spirit baptism is for everyone. So next in our story, Peter gets up in verse 15 and begins to speak to this crowd of thousands of people that had gathered. He says, these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days, it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And so as Peter gets up and speaks to the crowd, he first debunks the mockers who said the believers were drunk, and that this was not a supernatural event at all. And then he goes on to say that what was happening on the day of Pentecost was prophesied in the Old Testament by the prophet Joel. Spirit baptism, according to Joel, is a sign that the last days have begun. What are the last days? The last days is the time between when Jesus ascended into heaven and when he was going to come again in the second coming. We currently in the year 2020 live in the last days. It began on the day of Pentecost and it's going to continue until Jesus returns. And so in the last days in which we are living, God is going to continue to pour out his spirit on all people who will receive him. And so the outpouring of the spirit on the day of Pentecost was just the beginning of this ongoing outpouring of the spirit. It was not a one time event. It's a continuing outpouring. And the signs of the spirit being outpoured, according to Joel, are threefold. We will see prophecy. We will see visions. We will see dreams. And each of these three signs is one way of God communicating with his people through his spirit. Tongues is simply another form of prophecy in which the prophetic word that is spoken is spoken in a language that the speaker has never learned. 
Now, in the prophecy of Joel, we learn that spirit baptism is for everyone. And it's for this entire period, as we said before, of the last days until Jesus returns. Now, I'd encourage you to read the entire chapters of Acts chapter 1 and 2 this week to get the whole story. We're going to uh, skip over some of Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost. In the next verses, Peter continues to speak to the people about what is going on, the mission of Jesus, how uh, Jesus prophesied he would pour out his spirit. And he concludes in verse 38. And he says to the people, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And so these are two of the most important verses in the, in the book of Acts, probably in the whole New Testament. I mean, Acts 1.8 was the theme verse, but these encapsulates the whole message of the book of Acts and the New Testament. Peter is preaching under the power of the Holy Spirit for the first time. The Spirit is inspiring him to present the essence of what God wants to do in every person's life. The lives of the people that were gathered, the thousands gathered on the day of Pentecost, and the lives of people today. The three most important spiritual foundations in a person's life are given here. The first is to repent. Now, as we read the whole message of Peter in Acts chapter 2, we know that this involves repenting of your sin, believing in Jesus to forgive your sin through his death on the cross, and following him as the risen Lord of your life. The second spiritual foundation is to be water baptized in the name of Jesus. The third spiritual foundation is to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That was happening on the day of Pentecost, to be spirit baptized. And who are these three things for? Well, Peter said they were for everyone who was listening there that day, for these people's children, and for any others, everyone else, of all time, in all locations. And so salvation, water baptism, and spirit baptism are for everyone in our day, in the last days, until Jesus returns. Now, what happened after Peter concluded his message? Verse 41, it said, So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And so the result of Peter's preaching and the work of the Spirit was that 3,000 people followed his instructions. They repented. They were born again. They were baptized in water. They received spirit baptism. They spoke in tongues. And as we read throughout the book of Acts, we read detailed account after account as different people went through these same three steps of spiritual foundation. Spirit baptism is for all. Now, as on the day of Pentecost, there are undoubtedly three groups of people listening to this message today on Pentecost Sunday, whether it's uh, in person or online. Some of you have Receive spirit baptism in the past. And I would encourage you to continue to use the spiritual gifts that God has given you. And also to seek him for more, for more power. There's always more. As we read the book of Acts, we see the people who were baptized in the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 2, we're praying to be filled with the Spirit again in Acts chapter 4. It's an ongoing part of our spiritual walk. Others may be perplexed by this whole topic. You've heard from other people this and that, that it's not for today or, or this or that. And you don't really, aren't really sure what the Bible teaches on this topic. You're not sure why you need something more in your life. Now, if you're not saved, you can't be spirit baptized. So being saved, committing your life to Jesus Christ, repenting from your sin is the first step. But after you've taken that step, then you do need the power of the Spirit in your life. Perhaps you've even prayed to be Spirit baptized and seemingly nothing has happened. Well, keep on seeking. The disciples sought for many days before the Holy Spirit came. God will answer your prayer in His time. 
And perhaps there's some that are mocking and they don't really believe that this is of God or it's for today. But God loves you too. He wants your life to be blessed. Pray and ask God to reveal himself and the truth of his word to you. And if you sincerely pray that prayer, he will do it. Well, this morning I want to give everyone who's listening an opportunity to repent and become a believer, to become born again. If you've never committed your life to Jesus Christ, I'm going to give you an opportunity to pray with me. Or perhaps you, you've done it in the past and you've drifted away from God and you want to recommit your life this morning as well. To do that, you simply admit that you've sinned, you, you repent, you turn away from that sin, you believe that Jesus died to forgive your sin, you put your faith in him, ask for his forgiveness, and commit your life to following him. Uh, so this morning, this morning we're going to pray, and if you'd like, I encourage you just to pray along with me. Father, today I admit that I've sinned, I've done wrong things. I repent, I, I turn away from those sins. I ask for your forgiveness. I believe Jesus died on the cross that I might be forgiven. He took the penalty for my sin upon himself. Come into my life. I believe you rose from the dead and I commit my life to following you as my Lord and Savior. For those of us who are believers, let's pray as well. Father, we thank you for the promise of the Father, the Holy Spirit, who baptizes us, who fills us. The Spirit that you began to pour out on that first Pentecost. We thank you for Jesus' clear teaching on our need for the Spirit's power in our lives. Forgive us for being prideful and, and thinking that we don't need everything that you have for us. That the gifts you have for us are, are something that's optional. Something that we can get along without. God, for those who have never been spirit baptized, we pray that you would touch them and fill them this morning as they seek your power and your presence. For those who have been spirit baptized, God, may we follow your instruction and wait on you for fresh fillings of the spirit. May we Desire more of your spiritual gifts operating in our lives as you command us to earnestly desire. We acknowledge we need more of your power in our lives. We need more of your wisdom, especially now in this season of uncertainty that we're in. Thank you that you have all we need to serve you in our day, in our time, in our place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We invite you to join us next week, Sunday at 10 a.m. at our church at 15036 Clayton Road. We're now uh, open. We were open last Sunday. We're going to be open again, um, uh, continuing. We're beginning a new message series called Praying the Psalms. And our message next Sunday will be Prayers for Help, the first Sunday in June. If you're not able to attend our physical meeting for one reason or another, the message will continue to be streamed live online Sunday at 10 a.m. on Facebook and YouTube. So God bless you. Have a great week.